The first type of failure that we're going to see is tensile failure. Tensile failure occurs when you apply tensile stresses to the solid. Uh, for example, you may be familiar with the typical test of uh, tensile failure of a rod of a metallic material. In this type of test, which is called a direct tension test, we apply stresses uh, which produce a tension in the rod and as we increase that axial stress, in this case negative, because we're using the geomechanics convention, the rod is going to extend. And that's also negative because we are applying the geomechanics convention. So we are in the negative quadrant in this case. So as I increase, increase the stresses, the rod is going to extend and it's going to reach a maximum value. That maximum stress possible is what is what is called the tensile strength of the material. And in this case, this is under unconfined conditions. Before we reach the maximum value, we often see a range of elastic deformation. And after that, when it reaches the peak, irrecoverable deformation start to occur and if we were to continue loading this metallic rod in tension, we will see all irrecoverable deformation. If eventually we unload this rod, then we will have some elastic recovery, but most of the deformation is not going to be recovered. That's what is called a plastic deformation. All right, so this concept is uh, it's very uh, easy to understand and the test is also easy to, to picture, but however, it's not that easy to do in rocks. Why? Because in rocks, if you wanted to apply something like that, you will have to shape your rock such that you can pull from the ends. Uh, for example, with a metallic rod, rod you could uh, make a hole in it, put in a screw, or, or grab it with the jaws, and uh, or you could also machine the material so that you can pull it from the ends. But with rocks, that's going to be a, a lot more difficult. Usually machining a rock is not easy, and machine it like this into this type of shape in order to pull it, it's not going to be easy either. An alternative to this kind of test could be that uh, you bond the ends of the rock to what you're going to use to pull the rock with, but then if the cement of your of the bonding strength of your cement is lower than the bonding strength of the rock, uh, then you're not going to be able to break the rock, but you're just going to, just, you're just going to break the cement. Um, so, although you could do this type of test for a rock, it is it is pretty difficult. Uh, still, you could do this, and if you were to do such a test, similarly to what we did for the metallic rod, you could measure what is the tensile strength of the rock. And this is going to be, again, the maximum stress that the rock can resist in tension. Don't get confused by these two words that some more or less the same, or they start uh, with the same uh, with the same letters. So one is strength, which is the maximum stress that the material can take, and the other one is just stress. All right. So as you can see from this image, usually rocks are brittle, and what that means is that as soon as we reach the maximum tensile strength, they are going to break and they are not going to develop plastic strength, at least in tension. In tension, uh, most rocks are very brittle, and as soon as you reach the maximum, then there is no more uh, deformation because the rock is not decontinuum anymore. It, it gets broken. All right. So if we cannot measure this type of direct tensile strength in rocks, what do we do? Uh, nothing? Uh, no, we have an alternative test, which is called the Brazilian test. 
And in the Brazilian test, what we do is we cut the rod as a cylinder, uh, like this one. Uh, here we're just looking at the cross section of that uh, cylinder, and we applied a load along the diameter of the sample. If you were to do that, what you're going to produce is a bending of the principal stresses around the rock as the travel goes from one point to the other, trying to take advantage of all the surface possible in order to transfer that load from one point to the other. And that's going to cause a bending of those principal stresses such that if you were located at the middle, what you would feel would be a tensile stress in direction perpendicular to the loading and a compression in direction parallel to the loading. So notice now that this is not a direct tensile strength test because we are applying compression in one direction and tension in the other direction and also if the stresses vary from point to point. Ideally, if you were to do this kind of experiment, a tensile fracture, when it reaches a maximum, will start here at the middle and it will propagate to the top and to the bottom of the sample as it breaks. And the way that we process the data now is we need to use this force, but this force is not going to give me directly the tensile strength. So what I have to do is calculate the tensile stress at the point that the failure happens. All right, so in order to get uh, that stress, what we do is we solve the Navier equations of elasticity and the Navier equation of elasticity, uh, that one with the inverted deltas and the displacement as unknowns, uh, we're not going to do it here, but fortunately, uh, someone did that already for us, such that now we just have the equation over here. And this is the result. Uh, the results of solving that equation uh, tell us that the tensile stress and the tensile strength, if we reach failure, is going to be equal to the maximum load as a force divided by times the length of the cylinder, which is the dimension that we cannot see in this test, uh, divided also the radius of the sample. Notice that we have a force, we have two lengths, so that's going to give us a unit of stress, which is going to be the tensile stress. Something important to mention here is that the dimension that we are not seeing here, uh, the length of the rock, has to be equal or smaller than the diameter of the rock when we do this kind of test. Uh, otherwise, uh, the application of the load uh, might not be that homogeneous and uh, this equation might not work that well. All right, but if you carry this test uh, successfully, then you're going to measure a maximum force as time passes by and the maximum force in this case, uh, 2,084 newtons, that's the one that you're going to use and divide it by this amount in order to calculate the tensile stress. Another variable in this test is the displacement rate. If you remember what we said in the introductory concepts is that the time scale of loading is important also for rocks. And, uh, in this case, we are thinking about relatively fast loading in which uh, we apply a 0.36 millimeters of uh, displacement uh, per second. Usually these results in a test which lasts, as you can see here, uh, less than one minute. Depending on your application, also you could change this displacement rate. Okay. Uh, one more thing to mention about the tensile strength test is that uh, we could also uh, plot this force or stress as a function of time or of a displacement. You may be tempted to calculate in a stiffness parameter from here, 
but usually that's not a good idea. So the only thing that we're going to get from the tensile strength test is just the maximum value, which is going to give us the tensile strength. All right, so here you have one example about this uh, tensile strength test and how to calculate uh, this tensile strength. From this example, we see that the tensile strength was uh, two megapascals, which is uh, more or less uh, 200, 80 psi and here uh, just to finish i have a plot to share with you that shows the typical tensile strength of several rocks what would be the tensile strength of uncemented sand well if it is uncemented then it means that there is no cementation between grains and if there is no cementation nothing holding the grains to each other, the tensile strength is going to be zero. So there are many materials that I'm not putting in this uh, summary that they do have a tensile strength which is zero or equal to zero. For example, also you could have a fractured rock mass that the tensile strength of a fractured rock mass is going to be zero when you are pulling in direction perpendicular to the plane of the fractures. This tensile strength also is going to depend on the size of the rock mass that you take. And these values apply for unfractured rock masses. And we can see that uh, usually sedimentary rocks, they have a tensile strength that varies from zero to some very high values in order of 10 MPA, uh, which is 10 MPA would be about uh, 1500 PSI and it varies with the type of rock. These are just some values and uh, we also see that in general igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks also they have a very high uh, tensile strength. When you think about the tensile strength, for example, if you imagine uh, or if you uh, try to remember uh, a granite countertop you will see that rock is quite strong it's not going to break as i pull it well that one has a very high tensile strength in the order of 10 mpa or 1500 psi uh, which you know it would mean that in order to break it in order to break one inch square of that you will have to pull with 1500 pounds so that's quite quite uh, large and again, there are some rocks, sedimentary rocks, that they have a quite large tensile strength, but there are some others that uh, they don't have uh, much tensile strength at all. And uh, because of that, it's important that we measure the value so we can apply it correctly to our geomechanics applications.